Have you ever thought about how we pick our presidents? Picking presidents is probably one of the most important decisions the world will ever make. But how do we do it? When I was a kid, maybe like many of you, you might remember a lucky bag. It was like a blind bag and you didn't know what was inside. And our guest today says, sometimes picking a president is like that, except the stakes are much higher. You might get a grenade or you might get the winning lottery ticket, but usually you get a fungible, replaceable president. We've a lot to get through today. Our guest is joining us in beautiful Kilkee Castle here in Ireland. You saw that in the intro today. And we're going to cover his huge body of work to talk about how do we filter our leaders? How do we choose leaders? And in particular, how do we pick our presidents? He is a wonderful leadership scholar, teacher, social and political scientist, has a huge body of knowledge about innovation that we'll touch on today as well. He is Gautam Wakanda. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on the show. We've been planning this for such a long time and I found out you were coming to Ireland. So I got down in my car, drove down here and you were so willing to, to join me on the show. And I'm so grateful. There's so much we, we share in common, lots of invisible threads. And I wanted to kind of expose some of those threads. The first was you're a great friend, you're a great mentor, you're a great teacher, which was the great Clayton Christensen. Maybe you'll tell our audience a little bit about that relationship. Oh, absolutely. It would be my pleasure. So I met Clay, it took him like two years to get me to call him Clay, um, in probably 2005. Um, so he was uh, obviously a professor at Harvard Business School, and he was already probably the world's leading business thinker. And I was a extraordinarily obscure graduate student at MIT who no one had ever heard of. But his ideas had enormous influence on the US military. And I was a political scientist who was studying military stuff. And so I ended up writing a paper, taking his ideas and adapting them to military environments. And in the process of doing that, you learn a lot about the theory that you never would when you're looking just in the sort of the environment it's normally built for. So for example, Clay describes disruptive innovations as more convenient or cheaper or things like that. That's not actually useful in a military environment, right? Like, like what does more convenient mean in that, in that setting? Um, so what I realized was all of those things that he was saying in his books, those are descriptions of disruptive innovations, but they're not a definition, right? There are disruptive innovations that are not more convenient, and there are lots of things that are more convenient that are not disruptive. And so in the process of taking it over to a new environment, I had to build a, dis a, a literal definition for disruptive innovation that would tell you if that would work or not. So a friend of mine was working for a company he had founded, and said, you should go meet him. And I did, and I walked into his office. What he had not told me in advance was that Clay was 6'9". <laughs> so I you know, looked up, and I kept looking up. I felt like a hobbit walking into his room. <laughs> um, and I just said, you know, Professor Christensen, I, I think there's really not a definition for your central term, and I, I think I provided one. Now, most normal professors having this you know, like yeah. nobody graduate student telling them there's like a, a major gap in their theory would immediately eject this person from their office. Clay, because he was the opposite of that, sat down and said, you know, that's really interesting. Tell mm, me some more. Anomalies wanted. <laughs> anomalies wanted. That's right. Yeah. Tell me some more. And we, we talked through it and he was sort of engaged with that for probably about an hour, you know, exactly an hour. His, his schedule was time of the second. Okay. So it was exactly an hour. Uh, and then at the end of the hour, we stepped up. And even though it was the first time I met him, I already knew that he wasn't just a great scholar, which he was. But he was also just a deeply wise man. He was the sort of person you wanted advice from. And I was a second year graduate student, I was totally unclear as to what my path going forward would be because I was doing a PhD, but I had never planned on being a professor. I just thought this would be interesting and then I would do something else interesting. And so, you know, I looked up at him and I said, you know, Professor Christensen, I would love your thoughts on what someone like me should do after they get a PhD because I really don't have any idea. And he looks down at me very thoughtfully and he says, I think you should come teach at Harvard Business School. And I looked at him and said, honestly, I didn't know that was one of the options. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a political scientist. And he said, no, let's talk about that some more. And so that was the beginning of a 16-year relationship that, in a very real sense, just defined the rest of my life. So Clay worked really hard to get make me a professor in his department. That ended up not happening because, you know, the financial crisis was going on. There was lots of chaos. 
But the next year, a completely different department at Harvard Business School, which was really interested in my work on leadership as opposed to my work on innovation, which was got Clay's attention, uh, brought me in as a professor there. So I got the unique privilege of sort of having been, you know, his protege and someone he'd sort of tried to bring into the school and then got to be his colleague, which right. was an extraordinary thrill. And I think is when he finally got me to use his first name. Yeah. Um, and so then uh, up until the end of his life, got the chance to sort of see him, you know, as often as I possibly could and talk about ideas and engage with him about how do you not just apply his theories to other domains, which was where we started, but eventually how do you take his theories and sort of try and build the next generation of what they would be and where they can go next? Uh, and so we ended up working together on a couple of articles that were in Harvard Business Review. Mm -hmm. And then I will say that, like, not my next book, but the book after that is going to be on the things that we were tossing around in his office yeah. way back then. Uh, because, actually, so two weeks before my wedding, my wife puts up with a lot. Uh, two weeks before my wedding, I suddenly sat, like, sat bolt upright in bed and went, I've got it. I said, what do you mean? I said, there's this <laughs> thing that Clay and I had been wrestling with for, you know, 16 years, probably, of this set of ideas about where should, where should his theories go next. And like, I don't know why, but it suddenly snapped together in my head. And I ran off and I said, you know, I know we're getting married in two weeks, but she goes, no, 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 go, like, yeah. you will be useless to me there. until you write this down. Go write, yeah. So I went out and wrote like 10,000 words in a day. Wow. Uh, and I've sent it to a few people who seem to get very excited. So my, my sense is there's a decent chance that the book after this one will be that because, both because I think it's intellectually fascinating and also because I think it's what he would have wanted. To sort yeah. of keep keep that keep that flame keep it burning. Going. Yeah, and is that going to be the one I've heard you mention? Leadership in chaos or leadership in crisis? Leadership in crisis will be the next one, and then after, and then after that, we'll gotcha, be, yeah. gotcha, brilliant, brilliant. So I, I mentioned the the idea of a few threads. The other yeah. one I thought was interesting was, and this is just me <laughs> guessing, me throwing a, throwing a hail mary here and hoping it goes to hand, is that you're a, a polymath. And this is really important, actually, the idea of being a polymath is really important for picking a president, yeah. as we'll find out in a moment. But also, I found that from researching you, reading about you, that you don't go with the crowd. And even though Clay gave you this amazing opportunity to teach in Harvard, then later on, by a mix of circumstances, you didn't feel that, that was the right decision anymore. And while lots of people would have gone, yeah, it's a tenured position, it's great, it's Harvard, the dark triad might start to creep up and go, stay here, stay here. You decide no. And I thought that idea of going against the grain is so in line with this show. And I thought maybe you'd share why. So I loved Harvard. And I loved Harvard Business School. I was a Harvard undergrad. There's always something about coming back as a professor to the place where you were a student also. Um, and I love the people. So and in fact, I was just, I was literally just there on Monday sort of to sit in on a class and say hi to some of my colleagues so from that. But I am, you know, I was a political scientist sitting in an organizational behavior department, which in and of itself was a very strange fit, right? That had never happened before. I think I was the only one in the entire country in that situation. Uh, and so when I came in, there's sort of go write books, things like that. But over time, it became clear that this is a department where people publish traditional articles and organizational behavior. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's phenomenal, it's very important work, but it is absolutely not what I do, right? I mean, when I was a political scientist, I was writing books about business theories and innovation. When I'm in here, I'm doing this and stuff. And I just have this basic philosophy of life, which says so, so there are two parts of it. So one is, if you do what you are good at, you can find a place. If you try to shape yourself around a place, you will almost inevitably become inauthentic in a way that not like in a, in a you know, not inauthentic in the sense that you're lying, but in the sense that you are not doing the thing that is true to yourself and you won't be good at it, yeah. right? You won't. Um, but, and the second one is uh, the cutting against the grain has costs and benefits, right? So the cost is it just makes your life harder, yeah. right? So when I, uh, when I came out of my graduate program, uh, my advisor told me, he said, look, like, I love your work, obviously, because I'm your advisor. So if I didn't, you would have a problem. So, but I think I think you will only get hired by, like, Harvard or Oxford. I said, why? Hey, why? He said, because your work's so unconventional that people won't really understand it. And those are the only two departments that, that might. And guess what? He was right. Harvard, right? He was Harvard. He, he, he exactly predicted where it would be. Uh, and so my own sense of that is you can... 
a better way to tell the story is, is when I was at McKinsey. And mm. you know, the same thing. I yeah. left McKinsey to go do a PhD, which is you know, not a life-optimizing set of decisions right? in, in, for most people. And I had a choice between Columbia and MIT. And so Columbia was absolutely the best, best political science department of the world. And for what I wanted to study, was that was actually probably what it was best at, so even better than that. And the professors who were sort of my intellectual idols were there, and there was like every reason in the world to go to Columbia. MIT is a phenomenal department, right? Like there's no, I mean, obviously it's MIT, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna say it's anything but great. But it's much smaller, it's much less traditional, it's, it's you know, it is, it is a great department, but it's not the best political science department in the world, the way Columbia was. And so how did I end up at MIT? And the answer I said was, look, if I go to Columbia, I will do a PhD and it'll be a traditional PhD and then I'll be on a traditional tenure track path and that's fine. If I go to MIT, I will do something that is completely different from what I could do anywhere else. And that's exactly right. I ended up doing both innovation and, and leadership stuff and all stuff that you would never study at, at, a, at a normal political science department. And I said, look, if that doesn't work, I will not get an academic job. And that's okay. I don't need to be a professor, right? My worst case scenario is I'll come back to McKinsey and no, literally zero people on earth will feel sorry for me. Yeah. That, that, that's the outcome. <laughs> And the best case scenario is I'll do something that is just completely different and off the wall and interesting and true to me. And so I think cutting against the grain, it makes your, right, like the year and change where I spent like trying to figure out where I was going to end up, I still remember as the worst year of my life because yeah. I've spent, you know, all this time, like I said, my parents are like, you went to Harvard and MIT, like you should have a job, right? <laughs> like more than a postdoc, which is what I was doing a postdoc, like this is, this is a problem. And you have to, at some level, have faith that this is going to work out, which eventually it did, but there's no guarantee. Um, but if it does, I think you end up in a place that's just so much more interesting and rewarding, not necessarily in a monetary sense, but rewarding in the sense of that you're doing what you love, mm. which you can't get anywhere else. That it's it's usually worth it. Yeah, it's funny. The, I was saying this to my, my kid who's 13, and he's going through all, you know, you know, boy in school and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, look. There's a quote by Emerson, and it's like, it's one of my favorite quotes. It says, to be yourself in the world that's always trying to get you to be somebody else is the greatest triumph. Yeah. And, and that came to my, I was only saying it to him the other day, and I was reading your book at the time, and I was like, kind of going, this guy has done it too. And, and it is so rewarding. And I get it. I, I have to say to the audience, I get that it's difficult to make those choices, and it's brave to go against the grain. And sometimes it doesn't work out. But you do feel I did the right thing. And speaking up and, uh, against power is, is a huge part of that, that it comes through in the book as well. One last thing before we dive into the, the book, and we won't get near covering the depth of knowledge that's in this book, because it builds on Gautam's previous work, which is indispensable, which looks at a framework of how do you pick leaders, a filtering process of how you do that beautiful framework. But it's why are you in Ireland? What are you doing here? And how did I manage to, to yeah. <laughs> get you? Well, it was enormous good luck. Um, for for many years now, I've been part of the Timney Leadership Institute, which is this wonderful program that does advanced executive education for Irish executives, uh, you, often based on the Harvard Business School case model. So there have been other HBS professors who've come here and done this. And about like seven years ago or something like that, they invited me to come over. And I just loved it because I love Ireland, I love everything about everything except the bacon. <laughs> okay. Irish bacon, yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But everything else about Ireland, uh, I, I think is absolutely wonderful. Uh, and so when I get the chance to come out here, of course, I, I, I leap on it. And working with Irish executives who have this, you know, the Irish miracle is a real thing. When I, I came here when I was a kid with my parents and then came here, you know, maybe 20 years later. It's like coming to a different country. It's unbelievable. Right? Like, I, I, it's an astonishing level of change. But that poses challenges for Irish executives who suddenly, right, need to be at a world standard in a way that they probably didn't a generation ago. Uh, and that, if I can help them do that by bringing them sort of the best teaching from like Harvard and places like that, then I'm more than happy to do it. So. Brilliant, brilliant. And and also we have to say here, Kilkee has a special place in your heart because you and your wife, yeah? That's right, so one of my- Shout out to her. <laughs> hi, hi, Maria, yeah. <laughs> so one of my Timony sessions was uh, literally began two days after our wedding. And so, as said, she puts up with a lot. She's, 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 you know, do, do you want to spend? Do you, do you want to spend our honeymoon in an Irish castle? She said that actually sounds amazing. So yeah. let's go do that. Brilliant, brilliant. So let's let's get into this. And actually, what I was going to do is, and you know, you've seen my notes here. Yeah, extraordinary. Let's do a hell of a lot of research on the notes. But I'm actually going to go screw the notes, and I'm going to move on. But I'm going to quote the odd thing here, and 
when I when I started the book, like one of the first pages, you do you dedicate the book to to your wife as well. But you, then you quote a couple of different elements, and when I read them, I was like kind of going, I wonder what that's about because I do this thing with books where I try not to. It's like watching the trailer before watching the movie. I don't want to spoil it, and. The, the, I was kind of going, where is he going with these quotes? So, the, so I'm going to start in an unusual way. Hopefully nobody's done this before when they've interviewed you. I'm going to quote these three quotes and you, you will unpack, well, what the heck am I saying about these quotes? So the first is by President Roosevelt. And it goes, presidents are selected, not elected. So that was, I was kind of going, hmm, never, never heard that before. What, what does that mean? Right. So that's number one. The second is James Fallows, no real world human beings, brings to the US presidency the range of attributes necessary for full success in the job. And the, the last is somebody we're familiar with in Ireland. He's been here as well, Barack Obama. Nothing comes to my desk that is perfectly solvable. Otherwise, someone else would have solved it. So where, where were you going with those and why did you put them up front? So the first one is, and this is a, a central theme of the book, is that a lot of the work in, in picking who becomes the president happens before the first ballot is cast. And not just in the way we often think about that, where like, oh, it's party elites and donors and things like that. But there's a whole hidden process. What I would say is that for every, the way I think about it is for every president, there are a thousand shadow presidents. People who might have been president, people who could have been president if the if the luck had gone slightly differently, right? If the dice had fall had rolled a slightly different way, and the process of picking of of picking presidents because it happens that so much of it doesn't involve elections. It really is a selection done by parties and elites and random chance, and you it's hard to understand what the presidency is actually about and the, how you actually end up the job until you realize that there are these thousand people standing around who could have had the job. Um, so the second one is the Jim Fallows piece, mm -hmm. right? And the, the, that and the Barack Obama quote are actually meant to work together, which is the first one is the Jim Fallows thing, which is we should realize that the job we have created is virtually impossible. It is, right, it inv it, it, in the average day for the president of the United States might involve making critically important decisions about national security, economics, healthcare, the sciences, you know, and political choices. And that set of extraordinary, right, not, not just that there are many, many decisions you have to make and, you know, knowledge bases of, a, of extraordinary variety that you need to access, it's all of them are high stakes. There is no decision the president makes that is unimportant. And I think what that is really meant to drive home is the sense that anybody can be president, right? This is the sort of classic mm -hmm. American thing. Anybody can be president. Anybody can be president, but not anybody should be president. It is, in fact, an insanely difficult job, and we should actually work really hard to make sure that the people who have it are the best people for the job. Um, the United States is not a company, right? Governments are not companies. You do not want your government to run like a company, and there's no particular reason to believe that any particular CEO would be good at the job of being president of the United States or prime minister of, of I, right? Like there's, there's, mm. The skill sets are completely different. But big companies have much more carefully thought out and logical selection processes for CEO than most governments, and particularly the United States government, because it is very old, do for their senior, for, do for the presidency. And that should worry us, right? Because I would much rather have a bad CEO than a bad president of the United States. <laughs> and so the third one is, is you know, Barack Obama saying that, that the other one is we should view these people with sympathy, mm -hmm. right? Especially in the modern presidency, right? They don't have any. They don't have any choices where it's really clear how it's going to come out. Mm. And we should acknowledge that. You, we want them to try hard. We want them to do the best they can. We want them to sorry sacrifice their own personal interests for the welfare of the country. And more of them have probably been willing to do that than you would expect. Whatever we've been dealing with, you know, re more recently. But we also should say, like, we we are asking you to make choices where there is no clear right answer, over and over and over again every single day for four or maybe eight years, that it's going to take a special person to handle that, that task. Like I, when I saw that quote, and then later on, I read something that I'll reveal now. I went, firstly, to be a CEO of a company. There's very little empathy for the CEO because people go, oh, well, you're paid bit the big books, etc. Now, the big books in Ireland is not like the big books in the US and for the, these huge MNCs. But you give up a lot for 
the big books. There's a huge sacrifice there. There's thinking about it. There's the, the future of the organization, etc. And there's something I read in the book, which is just fascinating. You mentioned about Nobel laureates that the Nobel laureate that wins has great self esteem, lives for a year longer, on average than the person who was the runner up. But when it and that's usually the way when it comes to self esteem and feeling good about yourself. But when it comes to presidents, it's entirely different. Yeah, the, the heads of heads of government of democratic countries tend to live don't do not live as long as the people they beat in the election, even though they have higher status. And the sort of you can't come up with an explanation for that that doesn't involve the unimaginable stress of the job. Um, I, like the best example of this goes back to Barack Obama, right? Who goes and does the White, White House correspondence dinner and delivers an extremely funny speech, right? Like, I think it's actually the one where he roasted Donald Trump in front of the audience <laughs> and just does this phenomenal, almost professional caliber comic speech, even though he knows that at exactly the moment in time that he was doing that, people were preparing for the raid that caught Osama bin Laden, right? And, I mean, there's poker faces and there's that. And we should realize that asking people to do that, to, to manage that level of sort of stress and cognitive dissonance and, you know, even just acting ability is going to put a burden on them that will almost invariably shorten their life. I thought about that. I was like, there's, there's a famous study about the London taxi drivers where their brain literally changes because they have to go through this test called yeah. the knowledge. We, we've heard about that on the show before. And just very briefly, for those who haven't heard of it, you have to go through this test they measured the brain, the brain part that's responsible for, for for essentially navigation changes. It's bigger for a taxi driver versus a bus driver. And I was like, oh, the same must happen for some high stake leader like that, that there's almost like a PTSD reshuffling of how the brain works. That doesn't just go away when you're like mic drop like Obama did and go move on to the rest of your life. It stays with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I would give a lot to be able to do like fMRI studies of people of the presidency yeah. before and after right like what would you learn and then but um, but for, I think for any high stress job we can see like the implications of stress right we the uh, the metabolic level right we know cortisol when you first wake up in the morning a cortisol spike is really good for you your, your cortisol should go up you want that it's why you know cold showers or waking up or working out first thing in the morning seem to be good mm. for you because that's but cortisol throughout the day, is incredibly bad for you, right? And that's the response to stress and tension and things like that. So what exactly, I mean, what is the cortisol level of someone <laughs> yeah. who, you know, like needs to say, okay, you guys are going to go get Osama bin Laden. Oh, and now I need to rehearse my, my, my skit for the White House correspondence there because that also matters. <laughs> and, and you have a room full of people full coaching. Of people. That's right, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. But uh, the really interesting thing there was like, I was thinking that the, uh, the high, the high, high stakes of the decisions that you have to make. It's not like the company, you know, it's not like the company and the company, okay, we've made a bad decisions. We, we lost a few million or our stock price was hit a little yeah. bit. Okay. You can kind of manage that things. This is like the future of the company. And, and this is what the country or the world. When you talk about picking a president is, is it so, so important. So I wanted to just shift to that because I'm I, Gotham's been teaching all day. Hey, he's done six hours. Um, he's going to run out of voice, which is why I have a cup of green tea there for you as well. So let's share the, the filtration process, because your previous book, Indispensable, looked at how to pick a leader. You mentioned some presidents in there, but then you focused the lens. And by the way, that book was written in 2012 before we saw almost the predictive qualities that you had about how a dark triad leader might come to prominence, which we've seen, which we might get to later on. But there's, in particular, there's a two by two matrix that's so important. I'm going to show that on the screen for audience and have a look at this, and maybe you'll unpack what sure. the what the framework is about. So let's start off by saying that the book is about the presidency, but the, its relevance is not limited to the presidency. And I wrote it deliberately for that reason, and that's because the um, U.S. presidency is the greatest laboratory for learning about leadership that has ever been created. And there are a bunch of reasons for that, right? Like the stakes obviously are higher, the scrutiny is higher. But the most important one is really simple. Counterintuitively, we know more about what happens inside the Oval Office than we do almost any other major senior leadership position. American open government laws up until quite recently were just very aggressive about we're going to declassify everything and we're going to find out what's going on and we're going to tell you and then scholars can go and research it and figure it out. And so that means that I, you know, when... 
So there's the the legendary book and movie, right? Barbarians of the Gate about the buyout of RJR Nabisco. So there's a book about this where the reporter has gone through and sort of interviewed all the people on like what were the decisions both in the CEO suite at RJR Nabisco and in the private equity companies that led to this thing, right? But, you know, I mean, with all power to that reporter who, who did a phenomenal job, we don't really know, right? Like, there's no law that says you can't, you can, you, there's no law that says you're going to be punished if you don't lie to a reporter. Like, there's no one in the room that was, right? Um, he was not in the room. They're, the people who are telling him, they, they have every incentive to make themselves look good. With the presidency of the United States, like, eventually we're going to get the classified memos and we're going to read mm -hmm. them, right? And so we can learn about leadership in the presidency in ways that are relevant to leaders in all walks of life in a way that we cannot learn anywhere else. And so I think that picking a president well is really important, and I wrote the books to help you do that. But I also sort of always want to remind people that it's not the only thing, right? Like, we, we have to lead everywhere, and you can apply a lot of this in lots of other places. So the, the two by two you're talking about is, all right, I think when most people think about leadership, they think about sort of they're like, they're like good leaders and bad leaders, right? And the divide is between good and bad. And that, I mean, that makes sense. But what I've discovered in my, in my research and built and explained theories is that's actually the wrong way to split up the category of leaders, right? The, the other way to think about it would be more like normal leaders and extraordinary leaders. And extraordinary doesn't mean good. Extraordinary just means not ordinary, right? Out of the ordinary leaders. Because most leaders, and the academic research is actually very consistent on this, most leaders don't really matter that much. Mm. And what I mean by don't matter that much is if you replaced that person with the, like, the most likely alternative, right, the runner-up for the CEO's position, the difference between what actually happened and what would have happened if you replaced that person with the alternative is pretty small. And the reason for that is that most organizations put a lot of effort into selecting their leaders. So they evaluate these candidates for leadership. They do what I call filtering. And they eliminate from contention for the top job all the people who would do stuff that the organization sort of doesn't want them to do. All the people who are really, really different. So at the end of the day, and for a major company, this could be, or for the for a, you know most governments, this could be 20 or 30 years of evaluation, right? At the end of the day, all the finalist candidates are pretty similar. And it, you know, the variation mm -hmm. between what one would do and the other do is not that great. But Sometimes, not all that often for most organizations, but quite often for some, you get a leader who hasn't been fully evaluated, who is very, very different from all of the other people who could get the job. And because they are very, very different, they do things that no one else would do. And what, what do we know about decision, right? If you make a decision that no one else in your shoes would have made, what do we know about that kind of decision? I think what we know is that it's what I call high variance. Right? If you do something and everyone else in the world who is highly qualified says, that's a bad idea, most of the time, it actually is a bad idea. <laughs> and you will fail disastrously. But every once in a while, it turns out that you were right and everyone else was wrong. And you will turn out to be a brilliant, you know, like be viewed as this sort of brilliant genius success. Um, so these leaders who do what no one else would do are very high variance in their outcomes. And so unfiltered leaders have a high tendency to be high variant, high impact, and therefore high variance. And so when we're analyzing leader performance, more than good or bad, but, and we want to analyze leader performance because we want to get the ones who are good performers, we should think about high impact and low impact, right? Filtered and unfiltered, expecting the unfiltered ones to be high impact. And so then we say, okay, then that category has become a lot more meaningful because what we're actually trying to understand is not who are the good leaders and the bad leaders. We're trying to understand who are the unfiltered leaders who did well, who are the unfiltered leaders who did poorly, who are the filtered leaders who did well, and who are the filtered leaders who did poorly, because the mechanisms that drive each of those outcomes are very, very different. This actually goes back to the most important thing Clay Clay would always say about theory building, right? Something he said to me, like, more times than I can count. If you want to get a theory right, you have to get the categories right, mm. right? If the categories are wrong, you cannot build a useful theory. And I said that one of the big things that I learned was our categories of analyzing leaders were wrong because we weren't thinking about them properly as filtered or unfiltered. Yeah, I, lo I love it. I'm so such a, that framework. If you get anything from the podcast, that's so important to to understand that framework. I was thinking about um, where to go, and I thought maybe we we'd give a few examples. Mm -hmm. So filtered, unfiltered, for example. And I thought maybe the, a way to start would be with this kind of uh, bone of contention. Well, it's not really. Between you and your wife, who's your favorite president? Her favorite president is Teddy Roosevelt, and mine is Abraham Lincoln. 
Yeah, mine is Abraham Lincoln. Abe, Abe, yeah. yeah, honest, honest Abe Lincoln. Uh, and I mean, I am an enormous admirer of Theodore Roosevelt, who was, uh, but who was a very complicated man. He had characteristics that were not admirable and characteristics that were extraordinarily so. Um, I would say that while my favorite is Abraham Lincoln, um, Theodore Roosevelt led the most interesting life of any American and the most implausible life of any mm. American. Like, like he was, I mean, so he was right. We went to Harvard. He wrote a book that when he was a senior at Harvard. When he was a senior. Yeah, his first book was acknowledged as a like all-time classic of naval history as a senior in college, right? Unbelievable. Builds this incredible career in New York. His wife and his you know, his wife and his mother die on the same day. Goes out west, does this ranching where adventures where he's off, you know, like something from a movie. He's getting into, you know, Fist fights with gunfighters. <laughs> I and, thought of them as dances at wolves. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and chasing down bandits yeah. across the wilds, and then yeah. the, and then he comes back, becomes governor of New York. You know, and then becomes vice president of the United States, not because he was some incredibly popular figure in the Republican Party, but because of the sort of barons of the Republican Party, the you know, who were uh, taking advantage of the corruption that he hated, were like, well, what's the what's the most useless place we can put him? Yeah. I got it. It's the vice presidency, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I actually, when I when I heard you write about that, I didn't hear it talk talk about it before. It's like um, you were like, "What's the worst place you could put him?" I was thinking, "Gone um, on the Bing search engine, nobody ever <laughs> goes there, and now it's back." <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right. And then when McKinley is assassinated, suddenly he's become president of the United States at thirty nine. Yeah. Right. Like 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 he is going to be the youngest person president of the United States until the end of time. Right. Yeah. It's just inconceivable that anyone ever would ever would ever have this position. I, I don't concerned. just I don't interrupt your flow, mm -hmm. but the, it's so important to understand why they put him into the, the, the vice president role, yeah. because he, he was he was starting to expose things. Yeah. And it was a very different world then. I hope. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah this, <laughs> this is the essence of filtration. Right. They didn't make him the vice president because they were like, oh, this is the second best person to be president of the United States. They made him the vice president because they said, we want to put him in a position of no power whatsoever so all his reform efforts will go nowhere, right? And then they suddenly made him the most powerful person in the country, but they didn't mean it that way, right? This is what it means to be unfiltered, where the entire system is saying, we don't want you as leader, and he ends up as the leader anyways. Now, Lincoln is my favorite because, and I, th I mean, this is not an uncommon thing to say. I think religious figures accepted. Lincoln is the most extraordinary, like the greatest human being who has ever lived. And, and the most written about. And the, Yes, that's right. There are more books about Abraham Lincoln than any other person who has ever lived except Jesus. Um, and I, I would frankly say, he deserves it. Um, there is, this is another one where the story doesn't really make sense, that he, in his own estimation, had nine months of formal education. Mm. And yet, in the assessment of John Steinbeck, who knew something about good writing... <laughs> Said that you know he was the you know the greatest American prose stylist who has ever lived, right? And this is not, I think, hyperbole. Which is the, my example would be when uh, when Vicksburg and during the Civil War, when, when Vicksburg fell, the city of Vicksburg fell, and the North had captured control of the entire Mississippi River. He writes, you know, once more the father of waters flows unvexed to the sea. There is no other American president <laughs> you could imagine writing a sentence that beautiful and just write. Just say, yeah. Particularly then, because today they probably have somebody writing it right for them. them. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, to mention Barack Obama, right? Like that, the one of the things about Obama is his best speeches were ones he wrote himself, oh. which is really striking. Um, and so Lincoln also is as you know as unfiltered as it's possible to be. And there are any number of ways to demonstrate to demonstrate that, but the easiest one would be his total career in national politics before he became president of the United States was a single term in Congress, right? If a one-term congressperson ran for president of the United States today, we'd call it be a laughing stock. It would be a joke, right? And he was elected because he got the nomination uh, for the Republican Party because his team portrayed him as essentially the most moderate Republican. Because he had no track record in national politics, right? Nobody knew what his views on slavery were. Nobody knew what his views on anything were. And so they could go around and tell everybody, no, 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 he's, he's a moderate, he's, you're, you're fine. But of course, the person they got was the person who said in his second inaugural address, right, if every drop of blood drawn by the lash will be repaid by another drawn by the sword, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. <laughs> This is not a guy who was They're soft like, on slavery. Who put this guy in? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we were, you know, unbelievably extraordinarily lucky to get this uh, this man who, um, you know, 
So Stephen Peter Rosen, the great Harvard scholar of strategic studies, right? I remember when I was, this was the first, one of the first classes I took when I was a freshman at Harvard. And he has this Lincoln lecture on Lincoln, which is just mind blowing. And he concludes at the end that, that Link, Abraham Lincoln might've been the greatest strategist who has ever lived, right? John Steinbeck says that he might be the greatest, you know, the greatest writer the United States has ever produced. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on Abraham Lincoln, which is extraordinary, Team of Rivals, right? The subtitle is The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln. So we got one person who sort of pegged wow. the scale in three completely unrelated fields who came out of nowhere. Um, Bismarck, I think this is almost certainly apocryphal, but Bismarck is supposed to have said, God looks after children fools in the United States of America. And if you've ever wanted evidence for that, the idea that Abraham Lincoln would come out of nowhere to save the country at that moment in time is pretty good evidence for it. Brilliant. It's a brilliant segue for the the importance of context. Yeah. Because I thought about this and, and I, I was trying to link, and we're, we're going to do another show together on innovation that, this time, but I wanted to really focus on the book. And by the way, I have a copy up for grabs. Just sign up to our Substack, and you'll be in a, a chance. And it's going to be signed by the man himself as well. So... This idea of context, and I always think about context is so important for leadership in an organization. Context in, well, it's easy. You, you need a certain type of person to run the organization when times are steady and state. Then you need one when it's in crisis. It's kind of like the type of leader that you had during the coronavirus pandemic was really important. Yeah. This is hyper important when it comes to picking a president. Yeah. And it's, this is where the look part comes in because you can be lucky with the type of person that you filtered for, and they just happen to be the right president for the right time. A great example you've given before is not from the US, but actually from the UK, which is Churchill. Churchill, yeah. So absolutely, I, I always tell my students when I'm, you know, that, that there's a cheat code in my class, that if I ask you a question and you don't know the answer, you should just say, well, it depends on the context. <laughs> um, everything is always, everything depends on context. And there just there is just no question of leadership where the first question you need to ask is, what is the situation I'm in? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, luck. L l um, so Hyman Rickover, the American admiral who's responsible for the nuclear Navy, right? The United States Navy, the United States Navy runs a huge fraction of the re nuclear reactors in the world and has done so with extraordinary success. And this is a creation almost of this one person who sort of drove it through. And he used to say that luck is better than skill. I can't use you if you're not lucky. Um, so the Churchill example is is perfect because so Churchill becomes prime minister, obviously in you know in in May of 1940 in the context of World War, World War II, and he basically becomes prime minister because there is no one else who could have the job. And in fact, every major power person figure in the British political system actively did not want Churchill to be <laughs> prime minister, right? Um, the person they actually wanted to be was his was the person who would become his foreign minister, Lord Halifax. And it kind of looks like the reason Halifax didn't become prime minister was because he didn't want to deal with Churchill and figured if Churchill was prime minister for like a few months, it would be a total disaster. They'd get rid of him and then he could take over in some relatively better, better situation. Um, and Churchill's, the reason no one wanted Churchill to be prime minister was because they had made a very reasonable judgment of his career going backwards, which was a remarkable stre stretch of sort of disastrous failures. From, you know, the one that's most famous is the Dardanelles, where he sort of championed the Gallipoli Offensive, which was a catastrophe. But it was far from the only one. When he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, his economic mismanagement was so total that John Maynard Keynes wrote a book titled, right, The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill as an attacker. And when, when Keynes is writing a book <laughs> dedicated to attacking you, you have done a bad job, right? Um, and in, in the particular instant was that we know Churchill as this foe of appeasement, right? That's the, especially the American, I think, I think the British image image is much more complex than the American one, where we sort of remember him as the hero of World War II, which he deserves and is the foe of a people who warned everyone against Hitler. And so, you know, Churchill said at one point, one of his, you know, one of his speeches, he says, right, Nazism must be rooted, must be destroyed root and branch, for you cannot appease a tiger by feeding it cat's meat, <laughs> which is this wonderful Churchillian oratory, right? That all, like, you, you just hear the quote, and you're like, oh, that's Churchill, right? No, no one else could possibly say that. Well, um, I cheated a little bit, because Churchill never said that. Um, I, I changed one word in the quote. And the one word in the quote is Nazism, because what Churchill actually said was Gandhiism must be destroyed root and branch. Now, if you use the same vitriolic language to describe Adolf Hitler and <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, it is possible that people will stop taking you seriously. 
So during the run-up to the Second World War, when Churchill stops, starts warning against appeasement of Hitler, having spent his, you know, destroying his credibility by warning against appeasement of Gandhi, <laughs> people actually say, well, look, if Churchill thinks Hitler is that dangerous, it must not be that bad because Churchill is always wrong. Yeah. And so in May 1940, when he becomes prime minister, everybody's like, there's got to be someone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and and this is like this is like that's on again even though he was so experienced that's unfiltered right like like the system has judged him and judged him to be a failure yeah. but they just don't have a choice this is all they've got but of course in May 1940 if any other person had been prime minister of Britain I think Britain would have negotiated a peace because if you put yourself in that sh position any rational person would have said that and most so much so that David Lloyd George the prime minister who led Great Britain to victory in World War One right. No, no one had in his entire life ever accused David Lloyd George of being a weakling or a pushover. And that just wasn't him. Lloyd George says, stands on the floor of Parliament and says, we have to sue per peace. And when people ask him why, he says, look, this is a quote, tell me how we win, right? What is the story you're going to tell about how we win this war? And if you can't tell me that story, then we have to sue for peace. So I would say David, you know, Lloyd George is a pretty good approximation for what a reasonable person would do. And we know when, when, when Churchill was holding his cabinet meetings, most of the members of the cabinet, including Halifax, the man who kind of should have been prime minister, were saying, it's time to sue for peace. And he refused to do it. Now, we should all look back and say, thank God, mm -hmm. right? That all of the, you know, I, I criticized Churchill in the book for his, his attitudes towards India, which were barbaric and, you know, many failures. But you know what? If you're only going to be right once in your entire <laughs> life, May 1940, Good, to, you know, pick that time. <laughs> that, that's the one you want to be right. And there's no doubt in my mind that Hitler, that that that, that, what, that Winston Churchill literally saved the world from Adolf Hitler at that moment. Even and and the right the paradox of this is, it is the very traits that made him so disastrous in so many other situations that made him a success here. That his absolute vitriolic response to anything that he portrayed and he believed was a threat to the empire, which made him, you know. Right, express the desire that Mahatma Gandhi be stomped by an elephant in his protest outside out in India also meant that when you saw saw Hitler, who actually was that threat, he was the first person to realize what was going on and the person who would stand and fight when no one else would. Mm. So luck, right? If, if not for Hitler, Churchill would be remembered as an extraordinary writer who squandered remarkable talents by being wrong on almost everything in his career. Instead, we remember him as the man who saved the world, and he deserves it. It's so reminiscent of change makers in organizations. So somebody in the audience of our show, yeah. those people who have a gut feeling that something's amiss, something's wrong, and sometimes they get it wrong. That's the problem. Yeah. Or else sometimes their timing is wrong. I think that's the, what I found so relevant to what you're talking about here, because there's um, there's a there's a pattern recognition there of, yeah. of kind of going, this just doesn't. And, and I read recently that there's brain tissue in our gut and that's what that gut feeling comes from because it's connected to the brain but I'm, I'm bringing this to somewhere else which is that idea of being able to identify these people you talk about the great dean simonton mm -hmm. and how his idea of, of uh, brilliance you know intellectual brilliance and i'd love you to share that yeah. and maybe in this same bucket the characteristics that that you found from your previous book indispensable that are good ways to filter and so we'll, we'll do that. We'll do the characteristics, idea, the brilliance, intellectual brilliance, and what that is. And then we'll get on to the dark triad. And that will bring us on to another character. <laughs> sure. So when you're selecting leaders, right, what you want is, is the one who will succeed. So you want to understand what goes into putting someone in the filtered success and unfiltered success bucket. And you also want to understand what goes into putting them the unfiltered, the unfiltered success and, un, and filtered, uh, sorry, unfiltered failure and the filtered failure buckets, because you want to avoid those, right? So both parts of the equation really matter. And so Dean Simonton is the, the great psychologist of performance. He's done probably, you know, say that he, that, that he studies brilliance, then you look at his like 20 page CV and you're kind of, Kind of studying yourself there, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so he looked at leaders in an enormous variety of contexts. And what he found is almost always the, you know, like predictors of success are about context, not the individual. But he, including presidents of the United States, he said, look, were they fighting a war? Well, they usually go up in the rankings, right? The, the economy, but, but these things don't have very little to do with the president, the president him, himself. 
But the one individual level characteristic that he found that predicted success, not just for presidents, but that he found that predicts success sort of across domains, so for CEOs, for artists, for generals, just basically everywhere you can find, you look, is what he called intellectual brilliance. And intellectual brilliance basically is not the same thing as IQ. They are related, but they are not the same thing, right? So yeah, you need to have a, a lot of horsepower, but just as important, what he says is, you need to be able to sort of, you need to have openness to new ideas. You need to have breadth of interest. So, you know, he says a great measure is writing books. So Theodore Roosevelt wrote dozens of books. Great measure of intellectual brilliance. You need to have a variety of interests. So Roosevelt was also, right, an accomplished naturalist. He spoke multiple languages. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he, he, was, he was interested in everything. That's an example. Abraham Lincoln nine months of a formal education. And he's also, by the way, the only U.S. president to hold a patent, which is one of these random, I mean, why? Right? Like, <laughs> like, how could it be him? Yeah. But that tells you something about the breadth of his interests and how, and, and, and sort of how creative he was in a variety of domains outside of politics. Um, so Simon, so my argument, so understanding of the Simonton's work, right, it says that the, this intellectual brilliance, right, this is the thing that predicts individual success for individuals more than anything else in leadership positions. And the reason for that is basically that the world is complicated. In the presidency, we elect someone in November, they take office in January, and then they're in office for at least the next four years. Uh, I mean, if you can predict in advance what the world is going to look like three and a half years from now, like, you should do that. But you should be doing, you know, like, like do it in context other than the president. That, that, yeah. Then who gets you, you'll be yeah. do, you'll have the same success rate as Churchill. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so we're picking people not just to deal with the issues of the time. We're picking people who are able to deal with issues that might have no relationship to the issues of the time. And intellectual brilliance means that you have such a broad array of areas from which you can draw on new ideas and new and new approaches. And you have demonstrated the ability to integrate them into it, right? And uh, I can't remember who the quote is from, but like, a mind is like a parachute. It only functions when it's open. Oh, I know that. Yeah. Course, yeah. Um, and so, so, so like, you, it's, the openness to new ideas means that you can change your mind, right? So that, and that, that, nobody's right all the time. The ability to change your mind when you encounter new evidence mm. and new information is incredibly rare and absolutely vital. Like Clay. Like Clay. Clay, yeah, Clay, you know, anomalies won. And so Clay was the sort of person who would meet, a, you know, a, for, a, for a, a young graduate student he's never heard of tells him, I think you made a mistake. And his answer would be, that's great. Yeah. Tell me more. Um, you know, I mean, I didn't use the phrasing, I think you made a mistake. But it was very clear. <laughs> that I, that I, and, and he understood that right away. Um, uh, the, another person who's like that, actually more like that than anyone else I've ever met, um, is the American general Stanley McChrystal. Oh, he's great. I quoted him today in my article today, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Just, so, he, I mean, he started out as someone just I admired enormously and has become, a, like, a, a, you know, a close friend. And more than any other person I've ever met, I think Stan goes through life hoping that he will encounter someone who tells him, who, like, convinces him that he's wrong about something. And, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm putting words into his mouth, but I'm pretty sure his reasoning would be like, well, then I've learned something today, yeah, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah. like, if you tell me I'm already right, well, I already knew that, so yeah. I've learned something. And I genuinely think that a big component of his extraordinary success, and he is, in my, in my opinion, the greatest living American soldier, wow. um, was that he, was, he listened to people and adapted and changed and learned in a way that is virtually unique, in my experience, of people of his stature. Yeah, and I highly recommend his book is Team of Teams, yeah. a magnificent book. And he's a new book out on yeah. risk as well. Oh, yeah, he's a new book on risk. He's got a book on leadership. Yeah, he, he turns out a new book every couple of years, <laughs> which I think makes all of us a little bit jealous. Uh, yeah, Intellectual brilliance, <laughs> yeah. anyone? Yeah. So let's let's move on to, uh, I mentioned there, the, the characteristics. Yeah. So maybe we'll move on to the dark triad mm-hmm. because one of the things we were interested, we were going for a little walk here and, and our, the videographer today that's doing a brilliant job, David, was over with us. We were over at this uh, suits of armor. I said to Gautam, the thing about these are, it's kind of like when a leader gets to, to the idea of being filtered, it's like they can wear the coat of armor and then they take it off once they're, because they don't have to answer to power anymore. And it's kind of like, now I'm in the seat, so you'll do what I told. And actually the mask falls off. And that is so important. And this is where the dark triad becomes yeah. really dangerous because you can be tricked, particularly by a narcissist. Yeah. All right. So let's split out this, right? There are a bunch of different sets of concerns and let's mm. split them out here. 
So the first is this idea of what power does. So when you're picking an unfiltered person, right, you are picking someone whom you don't know that much about. That's the way you have to think about unfiltered people. You just don't know that much about them. Now, obviously, that's problematic in and of itself, because if you're picking someone for leadership you don't know much about, you could be very unpleasantly surprised. But it gets particularly problematic because of the unique characteristics of power. And so the, the thing about power, right, you often hear people say that people that power is moderates people. Not really. So what do we know about power is we, we look at experiments in the labs where we sort of, we ask people, this is the usual, one way it's done is we ask people to write a paragraph about a time they felt powerful. And then we put them in a bunch of situations and we just see their behavior. And what we see is that most people who are primed to think of themselves as powerful, what they become are worse people. Mm. They become more aggressive, more sexually aggressive. They, they're more Machiavellian. They're more, you know, they're, they're, they're actually more, more psychopathic and a lot of like, they just become worse people in a lot of different ways. And all it takes to generate that effect is asking them to write about a time they felt powerful. Wow. Not, they don't have to make them powerful. And that's what scanners, how do you know, how do you, can you detect that? So you put them in like situations where they have okay. to like divide up money between themselves okay. and have to lie about like something. Stanford yeah. prison experiment type stuff. That's okay. right. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, right, so one is, this is horrifying, right? So we pick people for, the, the, this is it's known as the power paradox. We pick people to put in positions of power because we think that they're like empathetic and caring and honest. And then the very act of giving them power once they're in this position makes them less of wow. all of those characteristics. So that's a big problem. And, but there are actually a small subset of people who become better when they're exposed to power, right? Like they... They become more honest, more altruistic, more community oriented. And what it seems to be is they conceive of themselves as moral actors. There are people who think of themselves that way, that the, every decision they make is a moral one, and their identity is bound up in the idea of them as being moral actors. So what this tells us is power is not a moderating force. Power is a liberating force, right? Once you have power, you are free to be the person you actually are underneath. The armor. <laughs> right, underneath the armor, but who you've been, you've been pretending to be someone else because you wanted power. Now you've got it. And so if you're picking an unfiltered leader, right, this is really problematic because you're, because you're picking someone who's pretending to be something they're not, mm -hmm. and you have not had the time or the, 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 the sort of deep contact that allows you to find out who they really are. Right? You want to know who someone really is when the cameras are off and the pressure is on, because that's who you're going to get when you give them power, not the person they're pretending to be. Ellen. <laughs> Ellen in the U.S. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but speaking of this, so we've seen this. So the the the, the great character that's come to power, before, and, and I want to emphasize this, in Indispensable, which was written in 2012, yeah. you foresaw this. You're like kind of going, look, we're in a dangerous time because sometimes unfiltered characters get through the net and it's not always like you talked about like i thought about that show designated survivor <laughs> yeah with keeper sutherland sometimes the president dies and the vice president gets the role but sometimes we elect for yeah. this or we and we elect for this with somebody unfiltered crazy things can happen yeah. so the united states in particular is remarkably prone to electing unfiltered leaders as president i mean essentially much more so than any other major country that we, we have people who are, who you just look at and you're sort of, well, that, you know, like, like it's whatever else you say about them, their resume just doesn't match up with what you, with, with what would get you that job in any other country. G give an example, because the great example you give is from the UK. Oh, we, um, so yeah, so the, the, the lead, so this may no longer be true because I haven't updated this yeah. research with the, you know, with the Boris Johnson's Re resume. Yeah. But when I wrote the first book in 2012, Right. The, I said that the, that I, I ask this question as like to audiences all the time because no one has ever given me the right answer. <laughs> not once is if you count like filtration as years in parliament, which in the UK, I think is a very reasonable way to do it. Who is the least filtered person ever to become prime minister of Britain? This is as of 2012 and literally zero people have ever given yeah. me the right answer. Right. Because the answer is John Major, who spent 14 years in parliament before becoming prime minister. I like to say that I am the only person in history ever to use the phrase "the meteoric rise of John Major." Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and but what this this if John fourteen years would put him in the upper quarter of American presidents. That distinction is yeah. is ridiculous, right? Like that you, you're giving the most powerful, you're making the most powerful person in the world someone who you really don't know that much about. Um, but in the first book, what I said is so is what you really need to do 
is avoid disastrous leaders. Um, and the second book, I sort of developed the theory a lot more and started thinking about how you to get better ones. But the problem, like, like your your first priority, especially when you're thinking about like the United States or CEO of a major company or something, something where you have a lot to lose, right? And not that much to gain. Like in the, in the United States, the United States is the wealthiest, most powerful country in history. So you, if you, another Abraham Lincoln would be wonderful, but after four, eight years of that person as president, we would be the wealthiest and most powerful country in history. Really, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. but the downside is much larger. Um, and so, the if you if you what what can you do to avoid the catastrophe, mm. right? And what I say is the the thing that you need to do is avoid candidates who have what I call false signals. Mm -hmm. So th characteristics that make them look more impressive than they actually are. And for our audience, I want to emphasize, this was published in 2012. Yes. It was written long before that. There is nothing about modern politics that I could possibly have imagined at that point in time. And I'm going to show on the screen table four from this book, from book which yeah. is Intensifiers and Facades. Yeah. That's a really important table. And maybe we can talk to that. Yeah. Okay. So in the so I'll go from the first book to this. The second book is where I ended up after yeah. I thought about this for another 10 years. Um, so the first book I said, like the, the four things you should worry about, the, what these all have in common, right, is they make someone look more impressive than they actually are. And the first one, as I said, pers personality and psychological disorders, where the examples I used were narcissism and sociopathy. And so the reason is that both of these create very positive first impressions, but have very large long-term costs. Mm. If you get a bunch of people in a room who don't know each other and you ask them to vote for the, the leader of the group, surprisingly often they will vote for the most narcissistic person in the room, even though narcissists are just awful leaders. Okay, so personality disorders with narcissism and sociopathy. I said, second is you really got to worry about sort of out of the mainstream or highly simplistic ideologies. Oh, yeah. That for any, you know, for any complicated problem, there's an answer that is simple, obvious, and wrong. And, but there are people who will try to sell this to you, right? So the third one is, is a, a extremely risk prone or incompetent managerial approach, right? Because think about this as suppose you just take a lot of risks as a manager, and there are a thousand people who take lots of risks as a manager. One of them is going to win 10 times. And that person is going to look like the greatest manager who has ever lived. But actually, we're just not seeing the 999 people who made the same decisions and it just didn't work out, right? And the, and the fourth one is, the fourth thing that we should really, really be worried about is unearned advantages. Yes. Right? Because we often ask people, did you learn from your experience? That's really important. You should learn from your experience. But that is conceiving of experience as a developmental process, right? You had this experience and you got better. Experience is a developmental process. But experience is also a revelatory process. And what I mean by that is you had this experience and other people can observe what you did. And then they can learn about you and make a judgment about your real capabilities. If you come from, say, a wealthy and powerful family that can make sure that no matter how badly you fail, you get promoted, then we are short-circuiting the revelatory component of experience so even though you've amassed this amazing resume, we don't actually know anything about you. So I said in 2012, you should be really, really worried about people who are narcissists and sociopaths, people who have out of the mainstream ideologies, people who have extremely risk-prone managerial style, and people who have unearned advantages like inherited wealth. So that happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so the 2016 election rolled around and suddenly I was like, I guess, huh. I'm, <laughs> I guess I'm going to revisit the presidency soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was the only one. So in the second book, we got much more specific because I really just wanted to drill in and understand yeah. that. And so then you're, you said, the, what we really need to think about, right, is like intensifiers and facades. That's the much more sophisticated version of what laid out in the first book. And the way to think about that is facades are bad signs. They are create. They are things that people create that make them look good when they are actually huge negatives. Narcissism is the classic facade. So is psychopathy. So is the third member of the dark triad, Machiav Machiavellianism. These are three character, three sort of psychological con uh, personality conditions that are often comorbid, right? Mm -hmm. So one, someone who has one often has the other two. They often come, and so they happen so often that psychologists have named them the dark triad. And the dark triad is just, it's, it's just dangerous, right? There, there's a really good article that says that if you want to think about the dark triad, the best example of it is James Bond, that he's sort of a perfect dark triad character. Mm -hmm. And if you think like James Bond is sort of great for Britain, but everyone around him dies. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. He climbs to the top by climbing on them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you don't want to be one of the person around him. Um, and and so this, so the dark triad is really scary, and that's a that, that, right. That's a facade. 
There are you can other th things about like gambling, things like that. But the other characteristic is sets of characteristics. So if Assad is a red light, right, saying just go away, the, right? Um, intensifiers are yellow lights. They're saying this person will have a really big impact, and you don't really know if it's positive or negative. So be really careful because negative is a lot scarier than positive is good. And the classic one of those is charisma. So charisma is the ultimate in, in, the ultimate intensifier. Surprisingly, it's kind of hard to get, find a definition mm. of charisma in the literature. And so I, in the book, I propose one, which is charisma is the ability to get people to do things through force of personality that you cannot through rational argument, right? So you are charismatic and you tell me to do something and I do it, whereas someone else who said the exact same thing to me, I'd be like, eh, no, not a chance. And so we have a huge tendency to select charismatic leaders. And in particular, we tend to select charismatic unfiltered leaders because, of course, charisma is at its apex when you first encounter someone. And it becomes incredibly powerful. And like this is a very real phenomenon. You see literature of people who like date or doubt the existence of charisma. And I'll say, if you have ever met Bill Clinton in your life, you will never for one second doubt the existence of charisma. His charisma, especially, you know, especially, you know, he's had a health problems now, but especially back, you know, when he was at his peak, was like a physical force in the room that commanded attention mm -hmm. at a level that it was, you know, that is impossible to convey until you have experienced it for yourself. Usually when I ask a room, you know, name someone who you know, who you've encountered, who is a charismatic, literally 95 times out of 100, somebody will stick their head up and I met Bill Clinton once and he was the most charismatic person I've ever met. It's just, he's just off the charts. Um, but there are other people like that. Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, mm -hmm. is extraordinarily charismatic. Whatever you think of his any performance, whether good, bad, whatever, whatever you rate him, he is incredibly charismatic. Um, but charisma is really dangerous. It, right? we, we always say we want a charismatic leader, and we don't think about the downsides here. Because if you are an extraordinarily charismatic leader, and you can persuade people to do things that they would not otherwise do, if your ideas are great, that's phenomenal. You can do things with the organization that no one else could get it to do. But if your ideas are awful, that's disastrous because you can do things with the organization that no one else would persuade it to do. Um, and so, and charisma, so charisma does not have a negative or a positive valence. It is just an intensifier. Um, that's really, really, like, that is really dangerous when you're talking about people of extraordinary positions. And so to get to where we were, I know we're going, is Donald Trump. So I personally do not find Donald Trump to be appealing in any way, shape or form. I make no secret of that. But Donald Trump is intensely charismatic, right? When he said, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose a single vote, I mean, he might lose one, but he's not <laughs> exaggerating by much, right? That is the definition of a charismatic hold on people. You don't have to be charismatic to everyone to be charismatic. You just have to be charismatic to a large, sufficient number of people. And clearly, he has an enormous appeal in that regard. It's so funny because let, let's conclude with this. Let's bring it full circle to innovation again. Yeah. And then and then what we might do is kind of go, okay, using my framework, if I was to filter for Trump and Biden, what, yeah. what would I do? So th there's that. And, and I just wanted to get this in there because you mentioned about the ill health. I found it fascinating when you said about how that has a massive role to play when uh, with a leader, because age is almost like a, a demasking as yeah. well. These intensifiers, uh, age is an intensifier. Yeah. So maybe we'll say a quick word on that. Yeah, so age, um, you often hear people say that, say that people mellow with age, but that's actually not, right, that's not it. What happens with age is you become a caricature of yourself. Your underlying characteristics become intensified and, lar and sort of larger. And so aging becomes an intensifier because the person you're elected, right, you, you elected the complicated person that you know, and what you're getting over time is the caricature of the person that you know, and that can be very, very dangerous. Um, so aging in leaders, and there are also other, right, I mean, we all know people who seem immune to the, to the ravages of age. I had my dear friend and mentor, Dan Aaron, um, who passed away when he was 104, wrote his last book at 102, and biked into the office every day till he was 95. We should all be so lucky, mm. right? I wish, you know, like I wish, or I remember seeing him like biking down the streets of Cambridge and going, "Well, I'm 27, and I, and I I'm not doing that." Right? <laughs> so, but as always with such things, what I say is, you got to remember that you, um, you're you're taking bets with the highest of stakes, mm. which means you don't want to rely on the outliers. You want to rely on the base rates. You want to think about the fact that on average. Things change. So you were a professional athlete. I certainly was not, but I like to work out. I am like like I'm in better shape now than I was when I was 22. 
but I don't have the energy levels that I did when I was 22. And I imagine you sort of noticed mm. the same thing, that no matter how much you were, like, this, this, the, there, there's actually this wonderful study where they had an NFL linebacker, right? Like, you know, the peak of physical mm. condition, like, just try to replicate the movements of, like, a five-year-old over the course of about an hour. And apparently, like, 10 minutes in, he was just on the floor gasping wow. for air, like, because energy levels decline with age. Uh, health declines with it. Your your resistance to sickness declines with age, and we know that if you you know just just having the cold or a, a, the cold or uh, or a flu makes your decision making substantially worse. Um, and so aging is you know like I would not say don't elect someone who's old ever right. I'm, I'm, this is mm. not a hard and fast rule. It means you kind of want to be careful mm. because this is right. Once you make someone president of the United States, it's. If they're not doing, if they're not up to the job, it's very hard to remove them. Yeah. And th this has worked out very poorly for the United States multiple times. I mean, very poorly for the world. In my first book, I talk about Woodrow Wilson, mm. who was crippled by a stroke during the last couple of years of his presidency, and that stroke, you know, might have led, might have played a critical role in sort of the failure of the United States to join the League of Nations. You can easily tell a story where if the United States had joined the League of Nations. Maybe the Second World War doesn't happen, or at least it looks very, very different because the United States is much more involved in European politics. The fate of the world hinges on the fact that this one man suddenly got very, very ill at one at a at a particular moment in time. That is not something you want to have too often. Yeah, I find that fascinating, and it's it's just something that doesn't really dawn on you. You know, and, um, the other thing I, I was mentioning was uh, I'm going to link this to a source of wisdom that I know you're a fan of, which is The Simpsons, and this is the idea that. Sometimes a leader in an in a, in innovation context. So I don't get any credit for my ship is headed towards the Titanic. That if I just avoid that iceberg altogether and nobody ever knows about it. Yeah. Instead, I'll go right up to it and I'll do this last minute swerve and everybody falls off the ship. And then I get lots of credit because people know I brought it from, I saved us from crisis, etc. And that is something that happens a lot in innovation, despite those change makers with inside the organization kind of going, my gut's telling me this yeah. is wrong. No, I think that's exactly right. And there, there are plenty of examples of this, right? So, in, I mean, in the presidency, I would say George H.W. Bush, right? Mm. The, the older George Bush is absolutely the case of someone who was, you know, performed an ex almost miraculous feat of foreign policy expertise by managing the fall of the Soviet Union. And I'm not saying he managed it perfectly. I'm just saying he managed it well enough that we ended that, that, that given that the fall of an empire is sort of extremely risky and you compound that with a bunch of nuclear weapons, we got out of that. But because we got out of it without any sort of, and without that, he sort of didn't get credit for it, right? People yeah. are like, oh, you know, you may, you know, it must, it looked easy. Well, it didn't look easy because it was easy. It looked easy because he was that good, right? So that's a, yeah. but it's not, but far from the only example, my, my favorite is, is Roald Amundsen. My favorite example of that is Roald Amundsen. So Amundsen was an, uh, an Arctic explorer. Um, he was the first person to reach the South Pole. He was the first person to explore the Northwest Passage. And he was probably the first person to reach the North Pole. Um, but Amundsen is far less famous than, say, Robert Scott, the English, the, you know, the, the English uh, explorer who was the second person to reach the Pole and who died on the way back from the Pole, <laughs> enormously disappointed because he re arrived and saw Amundsen. Or, you know, Ernest Shackleton, who was an extraordinary leader who I teach about in, in cases all the time. And, I, you know, I love reading about him and he's amazing. And under pressure and when things are in crisis, there was no one better than Shackleton. But if you were on an Amundsen expedition, there was no crisis. Yes. Right? Because he would have planned everything out. He knew exactly what to do. He would have run every experiment. He would have done every test. He would have talked to every person and gotten advice. And then he would have gotten you in and out and without without a hitch, without, you know, no cases of frostbite, no cases of starvation. Oh, you know, while everybody else is still struggling, he'd be back home sipping his tea. So it's, it's, I find this all right because, yeah. like, if I wanted to be on one of these expeditions, <laughs> I want to be on that guy's expedition, right? Yeah. But somehow he's not the person we all learn from, even though he is the person who all of our leaders should emulate. Yeah, it's a, it's a really important one. I actually, I call it the referee effect. So if a referee or an umpire has a good game... Nobody says anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's only when they have a bad game. So, so the last thing we'll, we'll finish on, I thought, was because you're you're exhausted and you're meeting some people here in you're going up to Dublin, is if if we were to do it again. Yeah. So if we were to use your framework to pick a president, how would we see Biden and Trump, say, for example? So um, 
interestingly enough, and you know, like, like, like th thank you for the natural experiment world. Really, I, I really appreciate <laughs> you, <laughs> you making my social. Look, <laughs> yeah. look. Like, I really appreciate you making my social science this this easy. Apparently, American elections are arranged for the convenience of my theory. Um, Biden and Trump sort of peg the scale at the two extreme ends, at as far apart as it is possible for the American political system to produce. So let's start sort of counterintuitively with, with Biden. Um, Joe Biden broke my graphs. <laughs> That's the way I put it, right? So I measure filtration. Uh, There's a bumper sticker. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I measure filtration by looking, uh, not, not the only way, but the primarily by looking at the number of years that people have spent in what I call filtering offices. So positions in the American government senior enough that political elites are evaluating you and going, you know, this guy going to be president of the United States one day. How do we feel about that? And so that's, you know, member of the House, member of the Senate, member of the cabinet. JFK. Um, so JFK was... Is he a example? What, like, is he a good example? So he was, so, so JFK was, yeah, that, even though he was very young, he was actually much more filtered than we think. Yeah. 30. Because he had spent, he was, yeah, he was, uh, he was, he was I think, 40. Who, 13 he, years, sir. Yeah, but he had been, th yeah, because he'd been in the House and then he'd been in the Senate. And that's actually quite a long time mm. in American government, actually above average for U.S. Mm. presidents. Um, and so up until Joe Biden, the, the, the record holder for most filtered was two people, James Buchanan and Gerald Ford. And they were both 26 years. So they had spent 26 years in senior political office. And these are very experienced, very evaluated people. And then Joe Biden rolls around and he gets elected president of the United States. Joe Biden had spent... 36 years in the Senate and eight years as vice president of the United States. He had 44 years of filtration before he became president. So I don't say this like, like this is not a joke. Joe Biden literally broke my graphs. I had to redraw all of them. <laughs> um, I, I need an A6. <laughs> yeah. so, so he pegged, and what I would say is with, with, with someone like that, who's that thoroughly evaluated by a system that's, that's working relatively well. So right, in no sense would I argue that the Democratic Party is perfect. It's not. But the Democratic Party represents, right, a diverse cross-section of American society, right? So there are people of, there are large numbers of people of every conceivable interest group and population and state who are members of the, Dem of the Democratic Party, which makes it very different from the Republican Party, which is quite homogenous, right? So the Democratic Party selection process, I would say, is it has to represent people who, rep people who are part of, like, every chunk of the United States. Whereas the Republican Party, in the way it's currently configured, that's actually much less true, where you can essentially win the nomination actually quite easily with, let's say, zero black votes. That's, that, that would be very easy to do with the Republican, with the Republican race. Um, and so Biden, what that should say is Biden is that thoroughly evaluated that everyone in American politics knew exactly who he was and what they were getting. And the age question aside, which is a real one, and one that Biden himself has acknowledged is this is, you know, like it is a perfectly valid question as do you want to elect someone who's as old as I am? Um, this should give you enormous confidence that he was up to the job, right? You should just give him that he could do the job. So strikingly, you know, you don't have to believe that Joe Biden is, you know, like as good a person as has ever been put on the face of this earth, which is a quote, by the way, Lindsey Graham, the Republican senator, said that about Joe Biden earlier in his career, to believe that, you know what? If he's president of the United States, you should feel comfortable. Again, the age question, setting the age question aside. Um, Donald Trump, on the other hand, is just as, is just as unfiltered as Joe Biden was filtered. He is the first person in American history to become president of the United States where his sum total of government service before that before that was zero days, right? He did not serve in the military. He did not serve in the government at any level. He had never, in fact, worked anywhere except for the company that he inherited from his father. So we have zero, zero filtration. There has it is it is not possible to be more filtered than Donald Trump. And to your point, lots of mistakes masked. Yes, over the period of time by his father's enormous wealth, and you know more of that has come out since he was mm. elected president. But even in when he was running in 2016, we had enormous evidence that his portrayal of himself as this hyper competent, you know, supremely successful business person was simply untrue. And I know there's a lot of debate on that, but let me put this very simply, right? So we know that Donald Trump was running, you know, Trump steaks where he was selling mail order steaks, and Trump water where he was selling, right? Okay, so Bill Gates does not run a mail order steak business, <laughs> right? And the reason for that is it is not worth his time, 
right? When you are that wealthy, the time, you know, the money value of your time mm. is unbelievable. I remember in college, just as a joke, I tried to calculate like how much money would have to be lying on the sidewalk for it to be worth Bill Gates's time to bend over and pick it up. And I think the answer was something like fifty thousand dollars, right? Like, like that, like mm. that, that, that was the amount. If you assume like ten seconds of time, like that's the amount of money that would have to be worth it for him to bend over and pick it up. So if you are, in fact, an incredibly successful multi-billionaire real estate developer, you don't sell mail-order stakes. Not because there's anything wrong with selling mail-order stakes, but because you're actually costing yourself money compared to what you could be doing with your time that's presumably more productive than that. I just can't get them out of my head actually wrapping them and fulfilling each order. <laughs> oh, is that a strip line? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that's like one of you, you do not run like fraudulent, fraudulent universities. It's just this, this mm. endless trail of things that, that make it very clear that this is not the sort of brilliantly successful business person that he portrayed himself to be. So then layered on top of that, um, you have all these warning signs that we talk about, right? So that, that so if, Narcissism is a, a sort of like a, you know, a facade of, oh, someone's really impressive. But um, there's this wonderful quote in my book from the psychologist who said that Donald Trump has saved me a lot of money because I used to have to hire actors to act out skits of narcissism <laughs> so that when I, you know, when I was, when I was, te when I was yeah. teaching class, I could show my first year students what a narcissist looked like. So now I just turn on CNN, right? right. You know I mean, and I just show them videos of Donald Trump, right? There has never been a more transparent narcissist in all of time than Donald Trump, right? Um, and you can go through the sort of like, I'm not saying by the way, that he is a clinical narcissist. Mm. I, I'm not capable of making that judgment and I would not do it at a distance. What I'm saying is that he has, and the dark triad is not about clinical narcissism or clinical sociopathy. It's about subclinical traits that are just much higher than the normal. So. I can't tell you if Donald Trump is a clinical narcissist or not, but I can tell you he has extraordinary <laughs> narcissistic traits, right? Um, sociopathy would be another one. I'm just saying, like, I mean, there are endless numbers of examples of this, but since we're taping this, um, we're taping this, you know, just a few days after the anniversary of 9-11, I note that right on 9-11, when the attacks happened, Donald Trump was on the phone with a New York radio station, and his first response was to boast about the fact that with the fall of the, of the Twin Towers, one of his buildings was now the tallest building in Lower Manhattan, right? I'm sorry, but that is as classically sociopathic, you know, failure to understand, you know, of, mm -hmm. of empathy and, and relation that you can possibly imagine. And it's not even true, right? Which is, of course, the perfect Donald Trumpian <laughs> capstone of the whole thing, right? Um, so just as Joe Biden was the most filtered person, you right? Donald Trump isn't just the most unfiltered person you can imagine. In 2016, and I, you know, and I, I wrote articles even before mm. I wrote the book saying this in 2016, like, it is not possible to construct a political candidate who had more warning signs of disastrous failure than Donald Trump. And because of that, I would say that electing him is probably the most reckless act by any major, any, any major government, any major democracy has ever made. Because given the stakes of the U.S. presidency, where... If you don't sort of, if you're not like deep into politics, you hear people say, oh, the president is the most powerful person in the world. And you're just like, it's like a po poetic epithet, right? When you read the Odyssey and it's, and you know, it's wise mm -hmm. Athena or something like that. Oh, the most powerful person. We don't really think what that means, right? The president of the United States has unrestricted, virtually unrestricted control over enough nuclear weapons to end human civilization. The president of the United States, right, can start, even stepping down from that, can start wars, can declare states of emergency, has enormous influence over the economy, over the environment, over the culture, just everywhere you can imagine. There, there is no person of the 8 billion people on earth, there is no person whose life will not be touched in a profound way by the decisions made by the president of the United States, even if they never know it. I'm not sure any person should have that level of power, but if we're going to give it to someone, you know, we should be really, we should be very careful. And we chose to give it to someone for four years who had every possible warning sign, both as, you know, as my book said, but as, you know, there were plenty of reasons to believe that even before I wrote my book, that he would, that he would use it poorly. And that is an action of, of remarkable recklessness. Now, before the election, I also wrote that, you know, that's not, that's insane. Like, there, there's a possibility of a good outcome. Um, the most reckless act by any major political party before the election of Donald Trump was absolutely the nomination of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. At the moment of supreme political crisis in the history of the United States, 
the Republican Party chose to nominate a one-term congressman with nine months of formal education and no experience in, mil in warfare, diplomacy, grants, or any of the things you would take to, to win a civil war. That worked out pretty well for us because sometimes filtered leaders actually end up pegging the scale in the opposite direction. So I actually wrote before that, you know, like I am not optimistic. This guy has every conceivable sign to believe that he's going to be a disaster, but it might work out well. And sadly, I was, you know, not at all surprised by the outcome we got. That, that was so important. And I think a final point, I, I thought about this from an innovation perspective, that the company's not doing well. Let's throw a Hail Mary pass and, you know, with, with this election of the leader. And it felt like that. It felt at the time, I remember thinking, kind of going, well, same, same like you, maybe this is what's needed. Shake up the status quo, the bureaucracy. And, you know, the, the, the elites picking the, per, or at least creating the pool from which is the leader is picked each time. And then I went, why? Why did it, how, why did it happen? Because so many people wanted him in, in position. And I suppose that's a big, big question, but maybe one that we'll land today's ship on. Sure. So the first thing to remember is that Donald Trump could not have won in any other country, by which I mean there is no other major country with a presidential system where the person who gets fewer votes can win the election. Right? So Donald Trump won in the Electoral College, but he did not, the, you know, not only did a majority of Americans not vote for him, he actually got a smaller proportion of the popular vote than Mitt Romney did in 2012. So the, what we say is that, that if 30,000 votes had gone differently, Hillary Clinton would have won that election. And in the popular vote, the 2016 election was not close. Most Americans did not vote for Donald Trump, and he never represented a majority of the American population. He won in a very real sense because he drew an inside straight in the Electoral College, and it was kind of a fluke thing. And we should, you know, obviously a big theme of my work is fluke things really matter, and we should understand mm. when they happen, but we should also understand that maybe, you don't, I don't want to overread, right? That, so but the second thing is, um, is, to, is to how this would happen is, so in my second book, I was trying to understand how is it that filtered leaders fail, right? Because that should never happen, mm. right? If they're so thoroughly evaluated, why do they fail? And, um, and the answer I came to is that filtered leaders fail when the system that selects them has been captured by a single concentrated interest group that essentially says, you only get to run the organization, whether it be CEO or president, if you serve our interests first, even if that harms the organization as a whole. Yeah. And there, you know, when I, whenever I talk to say this to, to executives, you get these nods of like, oh, yes, I've, I've been in organizations that were run that way, right? In the United States, in 1856, that was the, that, organi that organization was the slaveholding power in the South, which had captured control of the Democratic Party and essentially said, you know, the, the Democrats nominee for president doesn't have to be a Southerner, but he has to be someone who will give Southerners everything they want in order to increase the power of slavery. And we got the, you know, the most disastrous president in American history in James B. Cannon because mm -hmm. of that. So... In the, the election of Donald Trump, but so we, we actually just the perfectly timed to, because just today we got excerpts from Mitt Romney, a biography of Mitt Romney, where Mitt Romney talks about, you know, in this biography, about how other Republican elites talk about Donald Trump. And he says, you know, he was the only Republican senator to vote to convict Donald Trump the first time he was impeached. The only one. But he says, you know, when when the cameras are off. Essentially, every other Republican senator will tell you that if they had voted their conscience, they would also vote to convict Donald Trump. Every other Republican senator will tell you this guy is a joke and a nightmare and a disaster, right? So one is, you know, we should feel like horrified and disturbed by the fact that if you are a U.S. senator, you are a wealthy and powerful person and you have sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And apparently, other than Mitt Romney, according to Mitt Romney's testimony about his own co-partisans, not one of those people took that oath seriously. That's horrifying beyond words. But in the case of, right, the particular case of Donald Trump, what is clear is like Republican Party elites, not uniformly, you know, but pretty close to that, were looking at this guy and going, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster. But they didn't stand up and say anything because the Donald, the Trump movement had got so much control of the party. They said, you know, I, my career will be over, so I'd rather be better off silent. Now, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that position. You know, this is the, the cutting against the grain thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if there's nothing you're willing to risk your career for, what is the, like, what is the point of having you here, right? Like, and if, if you're willing to do it because you want to pursue an interesting idea, surely you should do it when, say, the existence of the United States is on the line. But 
that tendency of when you say, how did he get elected? Well, in the United States, we have harsh, we have you know harsh partisanship where almost everybody will vote for the nominee of their party, with what whatever else they say, and most people do not pay attention to politics in any meaningful level. I not only am I not surprised that most you know that not that most Republicans voted for Donald Trump, it doesn't even bother me, right? The most important distinction in politics is not between Republicans and Democrats. It's not between liberals and conservatives. It is between people who pay attention to politics and people who do not. Most people do not pay attention to politics. Mm. I am, you know, like I pay attention to politics. I have a PhD in political science, but that makes means that I have far more in common with a conservative who pays attention to politics than either of us does with most Americans who pay no attention to politics. Mm. So yeah, of course, most people voted for him because most people voted this guy and what they knew about him was, well, he's this billionaire. He's been on mm. TV a lot. He's successful. The Republican party picked him. I always vote for Republican. So none of that was surprising. It's why I wrote columns before mm. the election saying there's every chance mm. this guy could win. We should take it seriously. Um, what does bother me and where the system has clearly failed in the United States is the party elites who knew what they were getting, who were, do not have the excuse of not paying attention to politics and who still did not stand up and do the right thing. Not as I conceive it to be, you know, we might have differences in what the right thing is, and that's fine. You know, I still respect you if, you if you do what you think is the right thing. They did not stand up and do the right thing for what they clearly knew the right thing to do was. And that is genuinely horrifying and truly sad and something that makes me, you know, worry for the future of the country in a very good way. I think the, the term, Edmund Burke's quote, all that's required for evil to prosper is good men do nothing, yeah. is, was branded in my brain as a kid because I have this fairness thing that just drives me nuts if I if I see that and I think that's a common trait with innovators and change makers that you, you have to speak truth to power even if you lose because if you don't it's just going to eat you up for the rest of your life and a lot of people don't can't do that and you know we saw that in Nazi Germany yeah. a lot of people gained hugely from the the system and the whole Nuremberg, Nuremberg defense of things but uh it, it's really wrong. It's something that's so important from your work. So I think that's exactly right. And maybe this is the great note to add on, right? Which is, it's not just that it's very important to speak truth to power. It's that every human tendency is to not do that for most people. And that's very powerful because, so very few people ever go through life. Um, and like very few people wake up and say, I'm going to do the wrong thing today, right? I, very few of those Republican senators who, in my opinion, and apparently in their own opinion, betrayed their oaths, woke up that morning and said, I'm going to sell out my country today. That's not how people work, right? What happens is there are things that we want to do, and we want to do this. I want to stay in the Senate. I want to continue my career. I want to make money. I want. It doesn't matter. There are things that we want to do. And then because we want to do them, we construct a story that we tell ourselves about how this is the right thing to do. And that allows, it frees us to do that, right? So the story is, the conven is, is, is always self-justifying. And it's, you know, actually, if I don't, if I keep my mouth shut, I'll be on the inside of Republican politics and I'll be able to moderate the damage and I'll make sure <laughs> that that's okay, right? And, like, and right, the story is not absurd. It's not obviously wrong. But it's very convenient, right? Because it means that you don't have to do the hard thing. You can do the easy thing and tell yourself that it's the right thing to do. So at West Point, they say, right, give me the cards to choose the hard right over the easy wrong. And I always think that that is not like 100% of moral philosophy, but it's like 95% of moral philosophy. That the, the right thing to do is very rarely the easy thing to do. And because we human beings are so good at justifying, right? Like, uh, uh, my, my, what I like to say is that we are not rational beings. We are rationalizing ones, right? We don't like construct these perfectly rational arguments and then do something. We've got this thing we want to do and then we make up reasons as to why it's the right mm -hmm. thing to do and then we do it. And so it's so important to, it's not just so important to speak truth to power. It's so important to do what you just did for all, every, for all of us. It's so important to send the message that it is vitally important to speak truth to power because it is not easy. So you need to constantly hear this message that if the story you're telling yourself gives you an excuse to not speak truth to power, then the story you're telling yourself probably isn't a true one. Beautiful. Mic drop. That's the Barack Obama mic drop moment right there.
I want a final question for you is where can people find you? And don't forget, there's a copy of this beautiful book up for grabs. It's going to be signed now in a moment as well. Where is the best place for you? And you have a wildly successful podcast as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So if you if you if you enjoyed listening to me, you can hear more on World Reimagined with Gotham Mukunda, which I which uh, I host for Na the Nasdaq, the American company, which is a lot of fun. And you know, we, I, I got to say, now you've given me you give me a lot of ideas from your show that I want to incorporate into that. So that'll be something. But uh, for the books itself, um, it, so like essentially any major any bookstore can order it for you. You can also get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or you know the the UK equivalents of that. Uh, if you do get it on Amazon, please leave a review and things like Absolutely. that. But uh, but uh, re, uh, you can also find me on, I was about to say on Twitter, on X, yeah. <laughs> at G. Mukunda, and I would love to hear from you. And LinkedIn and your website. That's right, of course. And on LinkedIn and my website, www.gothamukunda, spelled G-A-U-T-A-M-M-U-K-U-N-D-A, Dot com. You can find me there too, and I look. And I I always love to hear with anybody, and I, not just from fans. If you see something and you and you disagree with me, come tell me. I might learn something. Anomalies wanted. Anomalies go to, wanted. Go to Makonda. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It was a real pleasure.